It's an eight-game winning streak for this Duke basketball team. We're having a whole lot of fun, but just how good is this Duke basketball team? Brendan Marks of The Athletic stops back by. He's going to tell us on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils. Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Locked On Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson. Thanks so much for being with us here today. This is our Tuesday, January 16th episode of Locked On Blue Devils, and excited to talk about everything going on in the life of Duke basketball and in Duke athletics. This Duke basketball team has an eight game winning streak, most recently winning over Georgia Tech at home this past weekend. Full week off for the Blue Devils before they're back in action this upcoming Saturday. So who better to have on the show than our good friend, Brendan Marks of The Athletic, who will stop by today to let us know just how good is this Duke team. And uh, that's going to be a fun conversation that you don't want to miss. If you have not done so already, please be sure to follow and subscribe to Lockdown Blue Devils for free, wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Watch the show on YouTube each and every day. Shout out to all of our everydayers out there. Let me know if you're an everydayer in the comment below. Appreciate your support each and every day. So without further ado, very excited to bring him back on. It's our good friend, Brendan Marks of The Athletic, who's here with us. First time in 2024. Thanks for being here with us, Brendan. Glad, glad to be making our debut. Yeah, thanks for having me as always. <laughs> All right, let's get to it, man. The Stuke basketball team has won eight in a row. I think we got to start with kind of the most recent game for Duke first, that being Saturday against Georgia Tech. We're riding high, feeling good about what to expect. Uh, we were talking a lot about does Mark Mitchell kind of get his, his face back a little bit after the technical foul at the end of the game in Atlanta. And then right before the game gets going, we find out that he's not even playing. So going into the game, the vibe's a little off and a little different. Uh, Talk us through Saturday, if you will. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, Mark Mitchell has been playing some great basketball lately. You know, the the difference confidence-wise for him from like a month ago to now, um, obviously before Saturday, um, was outstanding. I mean, it was just remarkable. It was like a totally different guy. And I think John Shire done a really good job of getting him – attacking the basket, being aggressive in his spots, especially as like a short roller and pick and rolls. Um, You know, Mark has the size to to be able to be an effective screener, but still to do that. So when you hear the news that he's announced right before the tip and the fact that it's a knee sprain, which unfortunately is now becoming a recurring issue with Mark, um, you, you get a little worried. And so I thought it was interesting that John Shire, his pivot essentially was, all right, we're going four guards. Um, and that's a lineup that he obviously has toyed with at times this season. We've seen it, I think, more recently than we had in the past. Um, and by and large, offensively, that that lineup was pretty effective. I mean, um, one of the reasons why Duke has been on this eight-game winning streak, and we'll get into more of this later, I'm sure, but it's the fact they don't turn the ball over. Top 10 nationally in terms of like not turning the ball over, and a large part of that is because they have so many ball handlers on the floor at any time. So um, obviously would have liked to have Mark out there if you're a Duke fan, if you're Duke, if you're John Shire, but um, I thought that the way the team responded was really impressive, especially given a, a you know feistier-than-expected Georgia Tech team. A lot of times from the fan perspective, when you're watching this game play out and you hear the numbers, Georgia Tech is not a good three-point shooting team, and they walk away shooting 55%. We've got Tyrese Proctor after the game letting people know that, look, this freshman guard is shooting less than 10% from three, and there he goes three of six in a game like this. That's kind of what you're paying attention to as it's playing out and the frustrations uh, that the Duke fans might be experiencing when there is a 10-point deficit in the second half. And all the while, as we're watching the events unfold, the turnovers keep popping up in the lower third on the television broadcast. And Duke is so much better in that regard than Georgia Tech. And yet there was a deficit at times. And that is one of those things that like, yeah, you don't really think about for this Duke basketball team if things are going well. But with any team, if you're turning over the basketball a lot, that immediately becomes a talking point. It does. It does. And, you know, I I was crunching the numbers midway through the game because it was, you know, Georgia Tech, I feel like was making this insane number of no, 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 no. Yes. Shots. Um, I'm sure for fans that had to be especially frustrating. And 
you go and you look and only three times coming into Saturday had they made more than eight threes, but two of those three had been in their previous two games. So I, I, while it is an outlier, I do think it's something that Georgia Tech appears to be you know, improving at. And so yeah. eventually, and John Sire said this after the game, eventually it gets to a point where, okay, this is how it's going to be today. And you have to be able to adjust and adapt to that. And so I think in the second half, especially, you know, it does get to be a 10 point deficit and then boom, you saw what Duke's offense can be. And that's the reason why this team is in the position it's in right now as a top 10 team nationally, you know, as one of the favorites to win the ACC still as a team that does potentially have final four potential. Uh, a large part of that is because of the offense. It's because you have guys like Kyle Filipowski and Tyrese Proctor, Jeremy Roach, who can just turn on a dime and put up a 10 0 run or an 8 0 run or whatever it needs to be in that moment. So I thought that stretch especially was really impressive. And we talked about Mark Mitchell being out. The guy who I've been watching the past couple of games is Tyrese Proctor. Obviously, he's been coming off the bench, started on Saturday in Mark Mitchell's absence. You're kind of waiting for him to fully get back to what he had been towards the end of last season, quite frankly, because earlier on this year, pre-injury, wasn't incredibly effective. And I thought that the second half Saturday was arguably the best half that he has played this season from an offensive perspective, getting to his spots, not forcing things. Um he was huge in terms of Duke actually being able to pull away on Saturday. Yeah, definitely needed it. When you, we've got the injury and your roster size kind of shrinks a little bit, need guys to step up. And now that Proctor's back and able to contribute like he was on Saturday, that's big time for this Duke team. Uh, the turnovers, though, if we kind of go back in that direction with the conversation, in so many ways you look at tied at halftime and then a 10-point deficit in the second half. If Duke weren't taking care of the basketball – that could have been a whole lot worse, and maybe there isn't even an opportunity for Duke to be able to survive. It's, it's funny. We saw uh, the Duke social media staff kind of put out footage of Shire and Jay Lucas talking on the bench during the Notre Dame game, and Shire and his coaching staff are like, yeah, we take ugly wins. That was raw, uncut. I mean, just that was perfect to see. And once again, we had another opportunity like that on Saturday against Georgia Tech. Yeah, you know, I, I think that something that – uh, it's going to be interesting to watch over the next couple of years with John. And, and this is just one example of it, but the style that Duke played last year, and I, I keep trying to harp on this, it could not be more different from this, this current team. <laughs> so he has completely traded out all of the length, all of the defensive rebounding, all of the keep guys in front of us mantra that was so impactful last season. And instead has shifted to this three, sometimes four guard lineup that is predicated essentially on three things, ball movement, shooting and not turning the basketball over. So Duke Duke is giving up size to teams. You know, athletic long teams. Georgia Tech is a top 25 team in terms of average length in the country. And as we saw on that Kawasi Reeves dunk, they have got athletic dudes. Um those are the kinds of teams that are inherently going to give Duke trouble this year. That was the team Duke was last year. They were long and they were super athletic. Um not the case this season and so when you have the team that is built this way, you do have to have all of those things going the right way, but that's what enables Duke to get back in some of these games. Even when they've gotten down, they've had those ugly wins against Notre Dame, against Georgia Tech. There have been more of them. They're able to come back because they don't do those things that they don't, they don't shoot the ball uh, for the most part. <laughs> they don't shoot the ball in the first five seconds of the shot clock. One guy just dribbling down going ISO. They don't turn the ball over. They do make the right passes. They do have multiple guys who can handle it. So defenses can't force them into traps or pressures and bad situations. Those are the things that this team has to do. And again, on the second half Saturday, you saw it. If they had been turning the ball over like that, they wouldn't have had any opportunity, no matter how well they shot the ball to get back in the game. That is the benefit of playing with three guards and obviously having a guy like Kyle Filipowski at the four slash five, who you know, is as effective a ball handler from a big as you're going to see anywhere else in the country. So it's eight wins in a row for the Duke basketball team. They're four and one in the ACC. They've got a, a break in terms of no midweek game in the ACC. It's the only time this season this is going to happen. So after this week, we're back to uh, our, our normal sort of ACC schedule. How good exactly is this Duke basketball team? And I think we'll have you save that answer for after this first time out here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils. I'm excited to hear what Brendan has to say on that one. Locked On Blue Devils here today is brought to you by our friends over at Jace Medical. I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of real life, but can we talk for just a minute about preparing for real life. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. 
I can imagine a more helpless feeling than not having access to the antibiotics and medicine that you need. Thankfully, we will be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, skin infections, and so much more. This stuff can happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. So go to jacemedical.com and use offer code Locked On to get $20 off your order. Again, that is jacemedical.com using offer code Locked On L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, to get $20 off your order. Jace Medical is a proud sponsor of Locked On Blue Devils. Moving forward here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils, J.J. Jackson alongside Brendan Marks of The Athletic. So, Brendan, I teased it a moment ago. People want to know, I want to know, just how good is this Duke basketball team from what we've seen over the course of this winning streak? Yeah, I, I, I personally, I mean, now in my role watching a lot more basketball from a national landscape, Duke is at minimum one of the best offensive teams in the country. At minimum, um, you know, since their last loss, they're six nationally in adjusted offensive efficiency for the year. They're top 10 in adjusted offensive efficiency, um, you know, top 25 in terms of three point shooting, top 25 in terms of not turning the ball over on offense. Like offensively, this is one of the better teams in basketball. And it's easy to understand why they've got four guys hitting at least 37 percent from three, um, three guys hitting over 40 percent like, you know, in Caleb Foster, Jared McCain, Jeremy Roach and increasingly as he returns from injury, Tyrese Proctor, you have a lineup that can be a legitimate five out lineup. And that's something that John Shire toyed with last year with Derek Lively, obviously was not quite the offensive threat at the five that Kyle Filipowski is. Duke has the offense to hang with most teams in the country. Um, it, it is that good of an offensive team. And I love the sets that John's running. He's getting guys going downhill. And he said this after the game on Saturday, and I think is really important, even in light of his injury, Jeremy Roach has been one of the better guards in the country this year. Yeah, Jeremy Roach has gone full on senior year Quinn Cook, um, and I mean that in the best way possible. Um, he has been sensational this year, sensational from a three point standpoint, an assist to turnover standpoint, and just like a when you need a basket standpoint. He's the guy. He he's the guy that Duke can draw up who can get by somebody else one on one, and and he's the only guy that I feel like I can say that about consistently. On the defensive side of things, there is work to do. Um, you know, Duke is still, uh, you know, one of the better defensive teams in the country. They're top 50 nationally, top 50, even since their last loss. But there are some areas inherent to what I was talking about earlier with the roster construction where they're not going to be awesome. They're going to get out rebounded at times. Um, you know, again, against bigger, more physical teams that they, they are going to struggle to score inside at times. Um, they're going to struggle to defend inside just because they're giving up that length on closeouts, three point shooters, like they, they do well when they are closing out with a sense of urgency. But when you've got, you know, in theory, four guards out there, like you did on Saturday, three point shooters are going to have opportunities against your closeouts. You're, it's just not as threatening as when, say, a Mark Mitchell is coming out there. Um, even a Derek Whitehead last year, you know, like those guys had more length. So I think Duke is, I, I don't know that I would say that I feel confident about Duke's ability to make the final four. I think they do have that potential. But this is absolutely a second weekend NCAA tournament team. And if they can get their defense up to a top 20 rating, which is feasible, Kyle Filipowski's improved a lot, then I do think that potential exists. But right now, the offense is further ahead than the defense, and it's up to John Shire to get the defense to catch up a little bit. And, and all that being said, when, when we talk about the defense, uh, a conversation that we've been following throughout this season uh, was simply the fact that the numbers aren't always the best. However, going into Saturday – Every game Duke had played, they were holding their opponents to below their scoring average. Georgia Tech, the first team to kind of do that. So uh, with that being said, with you know these guards that are out there defensively, how is Duke getting it done on the defensive end? What has kind of been that formula to make teams not play as well as they have been offensively? Because we talked about it all offseason, there's not that back-end rim protector. There isn't, there isn't. But one thing that I think has been huge and you didn't necessarily see it in some of Duke's losses earlier in the year, but their defensive rebounding, especially their gang rebounding yeah. has been a lot better. So Duke is top 25 nationally in defensive rebounding, despite the fact that they're playing Kyle Filipowski at the center, who 
is a seven footer, but doesn't, you know, he has what they call in the basketball community, a negative wingspan. So he doesn't have a wingspan that's as long as he is tall. Um, you didn't have Mark Mitchell out there on Saturday. You've got four guards, Ryan Young, who's one of their better defensive rebounders is obviously on a menace restriction is not seeing as much time as he did last year. And yet you're still continuing to see the rebounding numbers that you need to see Jared McCain, you know, pound for pound as a six foot three guard is one of the better defensive rebounders from the guard position that I've seen in a long time. I mean, that dude gets in there. He gets boards. Tyrese Proctor does have the length, you know, him coming back. I think that's an improvement. Jeremy Roach, Caleb Foster has length. Like that has been a huge key for Duke in limiting the second chance points that they were giving up to opponents. Um, you know, and then I, I think just in terms of they, they have shown a propensity when need be, and this was key in that stretch. They get down 10 to Georgia Tech in the second half. You start turning teams over. You start pressuring them. Jeremy Roach and Kyle Filipowski especially, I think, have gotten really, really good at that. Jeremy's point of attack defense, even if it's not coming up with the steal himself, but just throwing his body in there and, and causing a deflection for somebody else to come up with it, I think has been huge. So, Again, like this is not a bad defense. It's a top 30 defense nationally. Um, still top 50 over the last month of the season. But inherently, like those are the things you have to continue to do. Um, you know, the one thing I'll be interested to see is, you know, when Mark Mitchell is out like he is now, you know, how, how we'll see what the absence ends up looking like. John Shire didn't seem to have a great answer after the game Saturday in terms of how long Mark would be out. I expect it'll be at least a couple of games. Um can you keep up that defensive rebounding without Mark Mitchell? Um, that, that to me is going to be a huge sign of like this team's toughness. Um, and then when he comes back, obviously they'll be better for it. And so Pitt will be the next game for the Duke basketball team. Uh, Pitt, a team that Kyle Filipowski had a monster game against. He had a monster game on Saturday. Here we are talking about the recent play. And we talked about Roach. We talked about, you know, Tyrese Proctor's back into form and yet Kyle Filipowski's one of the best players that we're seeing in the conference right now. One of the best in the country. I mean, he's yeah. second right now nationally in Ken Palm's player of the year ratings, obviously wow. career, career high 30 points, um, you know, on, on Saturday, you know, the, the thing that now is making him a near impossible cover. If we're being honest is the three point shooting. Yeah. He's a, he, he has always been more of a stretch four slash five in theory than in practicality. Um, he's a guy who could hurt you from three, but did not always hurt you from three. And I do think there were games, especially against more physical opponents where he was liable to, you know, be comfortable taking those perimeter jumpers rather than necessarily mixing it up inside. He's now shooting over 40% from three in the season. And so what, what that is and what we saw against Georgia tech a couple of times, especially in the second half is when he gets the ball in the perimeter, you now have to attack those closeouts from a defensive perspective with a lot a lot more urgency, which then he's not the fastest guy in the world, but he does have the handles and the quickness to be able to then sidestep the closeout and get past you. And usually what he's doing now is drawing fouls. I don't know if people realize, you know, he's drawn five, five fouls per 40 minutes. He's top, you know, 250 nationally in that respect. Like he just does a little bit of everything. Um, on the inside, if you do try to double him, He's shown that he can he can pass the ball out of those doubles when he gets the ball, you know, in transition. We saw the Euro step against Georgia Tech in the second half. Like he has the ball handling. There, there isn't a real offensive weakness to his game right now. So he he's been sensational. He has to be for Duke to keep going forward. Um, it's a, in my opinion, two man ACC player of the year race between Kyle Filipowski and RJ Davis at North Carolina. And really the, the way the rest of the season goes is going to determine it. But he is he's been in that mix since the start. He's done nothing except get better. He's going to be in that mix for the next two months. Which is good to see. I mean, that, that game against Pitt in particular, the, the performance that he was able to have away from home, because even still, I'm looking at the splits, Brendan. I'm seeing 49% from three in Cameron Indoor, just 30 for Kyle Filipowski outside of that arena. But I think it's on the right trend going in the right direction because man, you look at some of these shooting splits for the Duke team. You talked about the offense being based around shooting when they are playing in Cameron indoor, my goodness, how much of a threat that three point shot has been for Duke this season. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I, with Kyle, especially it's now back to back games with at least four threes, which is something he's never done before in his career. And, and realistically, do I expect that to be an every game thing? Sure. No, <laughs> no, it would be beautiful if it was right. Um, <laughs> Let's end I, the fun now. Yeah. Right. It, it's got to come to an end. It's going, it's going to regress a little bit, but he has now, it doesn't matter. As John Shire said on Saturday, 
he now has shown enough of a threat in that respect that that's how defenses are going to guard him. And so he's going to be able to continue driving, continue getting to the free throw line. And like that, that really is one of the things that separates him is he does get to the free throw line with such consistency. And like, that's how he's able to keep putting up these crazy scoring numbers, even when, you know, I, I, I'm not meaning to say anything bad about him because he had a career high 30 points. He probably could have had 40 if he didn't miss the bunnies he did in the first half. I mean, he he was right there. So Or six free throws, you know? Like, there, there's still areas to improve. There's a lot of meat on the bone, so to speak. So, But now, even if he does regress and, you know, maybe he only makes one three in the next two games or whatever, uh, you know, not knock on wood, um, even that fact that he has done this the last two games, it's going to change how defenses scout and defend him, and that's as important as anything. All right, so eight-game winning streak for the Stuke team. Coming up in just a moment, let's talk about how far this thing can go, what we're liking about the Stuke basketball team, and more as we wrap up our conversation here today with our good buddy Brendan Marks of The Athletic. Locked on Blue Devils here today is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. The playoffs are here, and it's the perfect time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. And there's a lot of juicy offers out there over at FanDuel when you look at the divisional round coming up this weekend. One seeds, the Baltimore Ravens and San Francisco 49ers did not play this last weekend. Are you expecting a bit of a hangover? Go make your selections over at FanDuel as this app is so easy to use in so many different ways to bet like live same-game parlays, and so much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL and the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, back on Locked On Blue Devils here today, J.J. Jackson alongside my pal Brendan Marks of The Athletic. Do me a favor, if you will, kind of promote your work. What are some of the things that you're working on these days over at The Athletic, Brendan? Yeah, so all of my stories go up at theathletic.com. Um, if you haven't checked this out yet, highly, highly recommend. I'm biased, but I think we have the most comprehensive sports writing staff in the world. You get all my Duke coverage. You get the rest of our college basketball staff. You also get NFL, NBA, NHL, any sport that you could possibly want. We've got it. Um, as far as me personally, I actually just took a little bit of a road trip uh, for a Duke-specific feature that I've been wanting to do for almost a year now. So I was really glad to finally be able to get out and do the reporting on that. That should be out before the first UNC game this year. Um, but, but certainly something that I know Duke fans are going to want to read. And, and I think college basketball fans at large. All right. We'll be on the lookout for it. I love the tease. Can't wait for that to come. So uh, talking about that first game against UNC still a little bit away, but it is like, it's looming. You could see that it's out there for the Stoop team. If you're watching our show, here on YouTube, we've got the Duke basketball schedule scrolling across the bottom, but it's eight wins in a row for the Stoop team as you look at where they are within the conference itself and what's to come. Uh, what are you seeing for the Stoop basketball team as you forecast ahead a little bit? Yeah, to, to me at this point, it's a two. I mean, how many times have we heard this? It's a two horse race in the ACC <laughs> and it's Duke and it's North Carolina. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like one of those traditional seasons and for the better. I mean, both Duke and North Carolina are top 10 teams. They are both some of the best teams in the country. They both have final four potential. Um, and that, that, that first game is I think going to tell us a lot about both teams. Uh, Duke, especially because North Carolina right now is playing like the best defensive side in college basketball. So it'll be strength versus strength, the top 10 offense versus, you know, arguably the best defense in the sport in terms of the rest of the games Duke has until that point. Um, obviously going to be hosting Clemson in two weeks. That's a big game. The Tigers have lost three in a row, but uh, are still one of the better teams in the league. Probably, you know, if I were to put them in tiers, so to speak, I'd have Duke and North Carolina as a 1A, 1B. You know, they are alone in that top tier. And then I probably have Clemson alone in the tier below it. And then you get into the Miamis, the Wake Forests, maybe an NC State, um, Syracuse. We'll see. But, you know, those two teams are the top two. Duke can turn this from an eight-game winning streak into a 12-game winning streak, um, even without Mark Mitchell and Jeremy Roach. I mean, that is absolutely on the table. The thing that's interesting, if you look around the sport at large, it's been real hard to win on the road. It's been real hard to win on the road. And, and Duke has done it ugly in a couple of games. The Notre Dame game was not the prettiest. Um, and then they you know, were an absolute buzzsaw against Pitt. Uh, but but that is something that will be interesting to watch. If, if Duke can run it to 12 games by then, I think it's conceivable – that that's a top five versus top five game. Um, that first that first North Carolina meeting and 
man, is that going to be a fun one? I, I can't wait for it. But those those two teams are by far and away the best teams in the league and the two front runners to, to win the actual conference. So that first one, February 3rd in Chapel Hill, and then it'll be the final game of the season uh, where Duke hosts the Tar Heels. They'll make the trip across town to play Duke. So uh, with that said, we look at the Duke team, and you mentioned the injuries a little bit ago. It, it's a given that a team is going to face a little bit of adversity each and every year, and here we are. Duke's got these injuries to, to Mark Mitchell. Proctor had already missed some time. There was the Jeremy Roach injury scare. Where do you turn? How deep does this team go? Because as we saw on Saturday against Georgia Tech, Duke's not going very far into the bench this season. It's been a little bit since we've got to catch up with you specifically in that regard, Brendan. But what are you seeing as you go deeper into the bench for the Duke team? Are any guys close to kind of turning the corner? Or is this a year where, look, it is what it is? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a reason why John Shire's playing the guys he plays. I'll put it that way. Um, you know, Jeremy Roach, it sounds like, you know, John Shire said earlier on the uh, yesterday on the ACC teleconference that he's going to be day-to-day. It didn't look that serious. It didn't sound that serious. I think that's encouraging if you're a Duke fan. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Mark Mitchell, this is now a recurring issue with the knee, unfortunately. Obviously, we saw it last season in the loss to Tennessee. Saw it earlier this year. We're now seeing it again. Um, it's concerning. You know, it, it is what yeah. it is. But I would not expect that this is going to be like a month long absence. I think we're talking more like probably a couple of games. And again, the one thing that I do think Duke has done a good job of this season is when Proctor was out, it really sort of opened the door for Jared McCain to come into his own a little bit. And with Mark out on Thursday, it opened the door for Tyrese to come back into the picture a little bit. So I think that Duke has done a good job and, and John has done a good job almost by forcing the issue he is intentionally not going as deep into his bench, and he is allowing some of those guys who maybe haven't been as hot to, to pick it up a little bit and giving them those opportunities. Like, you know, I, I think what we saw from Tyrese in that stretch of three, three threes in the span of four possessions, that's huge for him in terms yeah. of a confidence perspective coming back from injury because he hasn't looked like that really since the end of last season. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Would you rather have Mark Mitchell? Yes, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing that he's out. Um, and then, you know, to me, Tyrese is, is a guy who is going to make a huge difference for this team in terms of where it ends up. And so getting him going, continuing to get him going. If Jeremy does miss the game on Saturday, if Mark misses a few more, he's the guy that I want to see more from. And I think that John's probably going to have more in store just in terms of drawing up sets for him. What's Ryan Young going to mean to the Stoop team moving forward? He's he's got to continue doing he's what he's doing and making the most of his minutes. I mean, you know, he had ten he had ten points and nine rebounds in very limited time the other day. Obviously, had a couple of key rebounds. Like that's the thing we're talking about. He has to when he's out there, he has to do that. And like, listen, he's he's limited. He knows he's limited. Duke knows he's <laughs> limited. Um, you know, I actually saw him after the game on Saturday, and he was you know telling a couple of friends like how old he is and slow. Like he <laughs> he's well aware, um, but. He, he can still be a really impactful post scorer. He can still be a really impactful defensive rebounder. And look, you know, he gets those bug eyes when he's got the ball and he's in traffic down in the paint, but he can be a guy who knows how to make the right decision and is effective passing it out. He did that a couple of times in the second half as well. So I, I don't think he's going to be more than a 20 minute per game guy, but in the NCAA tournament, you don't know what those matchups are going to be. And if Duke does end up playing a team that has a more conventional big man, he's a guy who has been effective at the college level before and still can be. But, you know, I, I'm not expecting like TJ Power or Sean Stewart to, you know, but suddenly morph into these superstar six men. Like it, it kind of is what it is right now. This is a seven, eight ish man rotation. Um, and that's why the injuries, when you do have them, forces other guys to step up. We're excited for what's to come. Excited to continue following uh, your work, certainly. You mentioned the big feature coming there as well, Brendan, and time is always so greatly appreciated. Before we get out of here, one more time, kind of promote The Athletic, if you will. Your company is so good. Every few weeks, I feel like we're teased with great offer codes to get people to sign up and discounts and all that sort of thing. So promote the work one more time. Yeah, well, hey, I, I think we might have a job for you in marketing, JJ. <laughs> uh, that's that's very kind to you. But yeah, no, I, I think, you know, uh, our whole staff is, you know, we have the largest college basketball staff in the country. So we're everywhere. I'm obviously around at Duke in North Carolina. And, um, you know, again, I've mentioned my role has shifted a little bit from the last few years. And I'm now looking at the sport from a more la national landscape now, um, doing some weekly power rankings for us. So, 
it's it's all of my stuff is up at the athletic. I share it all on my Twitter at Brendan R. Marks. You know, the, the plug is right there. Um, but yeah, please come interact with us. You know, I, I don't like I don't mind mixing it up with folks. So come do it. Like it's supposed to be fun. It is fun. It's been a fun season so far, and it's gonna continue to be. Thanks for the time today, Brendan. We'll do this again soon. Okay. Appreciate you having me, brother. All right, that's Brendan Marks of The Athletic joining us here on today's episode. Absolutely love that guy and his time that he spends with us here on the program. Make sure you go check out all of our great work. That's going to do it for our show here today. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you tomorrow. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.